Butter ready. Welcome back. We have two missions in this second video. Our first mission, as it is in all my videos, is to give you a tool, a tool called Scientific Method, which will, which will show you how to make your own analyses based upon your own personal, careful observations at the range, rather than having to depend upon any, anybody else, any expert's strong opinion. Our second mission is to complete seven tasks we will first determine your length of pull, mount and secure your scope, help you develop a cheek weld, adjust the scope's reticle for, for maximum sharpness, adjust your scope to your own individual eye relief, begin dry fire practice, and then finally, consider the four adverse factors that you will have to control if you want your long range bullets to hit consistently where you wish. You ready? Let's begin. I begin by assuming that you've watched video number one, so you have assembled all of the equipment you will need. Now we will go through the steps needed to make it your own, to mate it to your own particular anatomy. You'll find that your progress along this path to perfection now gets interesting, really interesting. Spend enough time with your equipment at home, on a firm table, on a carpeted floor, and I guarantee you will avoid much frustration later at the range. When you complete each of these next tasks, carefully complete them, then you will maximize your melding, your, your becoming one with your, your rifle and scope. I, I know this kind of sounds zen-like, but it is. Becoming one with our platform is our goal. The first step is to ensure that your eye is correctly positioned behind the scope. Make the length of the stalk long enough or short enough for your body size. The first approximation is most easily found by holding your rifle in the crook of your arm, seeing if your trigger finger fits easily into the trigger. Yes, remember to use an empty rifle to make the determination. Bolt out, ammo in another room. Have your stock cut down or lengthened as needed if your rifle does not have an adjustable stock. The next step is to think about the two firing positions you're likely to use and how to get into them. For your initial steps at the range, sighting in and so on, you will likely be sitting at a sturdy shooting bench, your rifle's forestock resting on some support, your body about oh, 90 degrees from the rifle's long axis. Think of holding the back part of the rifle in your arms as you would a newborn baby. Your non-dominant hand will hold the bag under the butt of the rifle to make uh, minor up and down adjustments of the rifle's elevation. Your dominant hand will be pulling the rifle back into your shoulder with a consistent force and your, your trigger finger will be adjacent to outside the trigger until you are ready to shoot. There are really strong opinions about how to place your finger on the trigger. And they are just opinions. Since we are all anatomically a bit different, some of us with short stubby fingers, others with long gracile fingers, we will do some experimentation later to find the best position for your own finger. As a first approximation, see if you can place your finger on the trigger so that the, the light moon shape at the base of your fingernail is opposite the trigger. Ideally, there should be a bit of space between the more proximal, the nearer part of your finger and the stock, but anatomic differences may not give us that option. For the second shooting position, you will lie down, it's called a prone position, your rifle's forestock supported on either a bipod or your backpack. The conventional wisdom places the shooter in a direct line behind the long axis of the rifle's bore. Uh, yes, this certainly works for slim 18-year-old recruits, but you know, as we age, we tend to accumulate, well, some uh, belly adiposity. Here's how to find your anatomically correct position. To begin with, lie flat on the ground without your rifle. Extend your dominant hand forward. Place your wrist so that you can feel your pulse. Ideally, you'll be completely at rest, head relaxed, head resting on your right upper arm relaxed enough that you might even fall asleep. Take your pulse. 
wait a whole minute, take it again. Why do that? The majority of blood returning to the heart comes from the belly and the legs. It returns north through a soft, easily compressible large belly vein. If we have accumulated some belly fat lying completely prone, completely flat on our belly, compresses that vein. Friends, squeeze that vein enough, our heart will begin to beat faster. A faster pulse rate will indicate a relative lack of blood to the heart and impending uncomfortableness. If you find yourself feeling anything other than perfect comfort or have an increasing pulse rate, roll a bit to the side. Lay your head on your arm, wait a minute again, check your pulse. Keep rolling as long as it takes to get a good blood return to the heart with no change in your pulse rate. And remember that position. When you finally mount your rifle, you'll find that as you roll, the rifle will be pointing no longer straight ahead, what, but will be rotating a bit more to the left and, and will rotate more and more toward the 90 degree position the bigger your belly and more you need to roll. There is, there is another probably more important factor to uh, consider and that is the uh, condition of, of most of our necks, our cervical spines. Let me show you. This is a normal 22 year old woman's spine x-ray looking from the side. Here she's looking straight ahead, neutral. Now here she's looking down to her toes. Here, up to the ceiling. It's flexible, isn't it? Supple. This is what a good spine should look like. Now turn this last image 90 degrees down and you have the position that you would be placing your head in or trying to if you were directly in line with your rifle, lying flat on your belly. Now, let me show you a 56-year-old man's spine. See all those boner spurs? He's trying to tilt his chin up, but all he's getting for his efforts is a whole lot of pain. If you have degenerative changes in your spine, one of the commonest diseases in America, trying to assume the position directly behind your rifle makes you uncomfortable really, really quickly. Rolling a bit to the side allows your chin to come back down to a, a downward flex position, taking the stress off those nerves. One thing we're going to be stressing throughout this series is that your own anatomy, how you are built, is going to determine the best position and shooting technique for you. Of course, women have different problems with a prone position than men do, but, but if you're a woman, the same exercises will ultimately find the correct position for you and your anatomy. Your goal is to lie completely relaxed, comfortable, as though you could go to sleep with no rapid heartbeat to disturb your shot let off. You'll find that most of the idealized positions you see in the books and on YouTube have been, have been worked out for slim 18-year-old recruits. Uh, the next problem to solve is to correctly position your eyes so that it is aligned with your scope's exit pupil. A little terminology will be helpful right now. This is the scope's objective lens. This is the scope's ocular lens, ocular because it's near the eye. You're looking at a variable power scope, so this ring allows you to change the scope magnification. The internal parts of the scopes vary and can be roughly divided into two types, those with a first or forward focal plane and those with a second or rear focal plane. I urge you, don't worry about this distinction right now. Right now, you need to consider the size of that circle of light coming out your end of the scope. This circle is called the exit pupil. It is a law of optics that increasing your scope's magnification decreases the size of the exit pupil. Since the exit pupil gets smaller as you increase magnification, the position of your cheek on the rifle stock, your stock weld, becomes more critical as you increase your scope's power. If your cheek is not solidly and consistently placed on the stock, yes, the stock weld, you will have a difficult time first seeing the exit pupil and second, maybe more importantly, getting back on target for a quick follow-up after you fire. And, and you're likely to have to build up the rifle stock until your eye position is correct. 
some stocks are adjustable, right? And, and if you have one, your problem is at least mostly solved. Stock not adjustable, there are so many attachments sold. All allow you to elevate your cheek weld to the appropriate position. For myself, I prefer to build up the stock using closed cell neoprene foam. Less elegant? Absolutely. Definitely tactical. And you can build up layers of foam to make the elevation exactly perfect for your own anatomy. Friends, it is worthwhile taking a serious amount of time on this eye cheek weld step as it is critically important for not only your first shot, but for when you need a quick follow-up shot. With your eyes closed, get into your cheek weld position and then, just for a second, open your eyes. You should be able to see the scope sex of pupil completely centered. If it's not, keep adjusting the stock padding until your cheek weld is perfect. You know, it's, e it's easiest to do this by bringing the rifle to your shoulder with your eyes closed, then opening your eyes just for a few seconds, then closing them again. Ah, it's now time to talk about eyeglasses. If you are wearing optometrist ground eyeglasses, if you have significant vision correction, you're going to likely have to get a special pair of shooting glasses. I know you didn't want to hear that, it's expensive. Eyeglass lenses are ground so that there is a, a, a central area that gives you the best vision. And, and believe me, your eye doc will spend a great deal of time and energy finding that best correction. But when you've lain your cheek against the rifle, you will be looking through the upper inner portion of your eyeglass lens rather than that central street spot. Have a friend mark that spot using a wax pencil. If the reticle is crystal clear and sharp as you look through that upper quadrant, no problem. But if not, take that marked eyeglass to your eye doctor. Ask, ask her to grind a special lens for you. Of course, there's an easier way. There's always an easier way, isn't there? Contacts. Contacts stay centered no matter how you move your eye. And contacts often give you sharper vision than regular glasses. Next, we must make sure that the scope reticle is focused exactly for your, your eye. Place the scope and rifle in your rest. Get comfortable, attain your cheek weld, open your eyes for just two seconds, close them again. In your mind's eye, ask yourself, is the reticle absolutely sharp? Do not keep staring at the reticle because I guarantee your eye will accommodate quickly. If the reticle is sharp, you're in luck. If not, Loosen the ocular lock ring several turns, mark the top of the scope, make a bold adjustment, say, say one entire turn clockwise. Do the quick eye open test again. Still sharp, take another entire turn. Eye open for a second, then eyes closed. Ask yourself, more or less sharp. Continue the experiment until the reticle becomes blurry. Write down the number of turns. Now rotate the, the ocular back counterclockwise to that baseline position. Repeat the tests going the other way, counterclockwise. When the scope reticle has become blurry, going counterclockwise, note the number of turns that, that required. Now, finally, rotate back to the position in between those two extremes. That position is where your scope reticle will be in sharpest focus for your own eyes. Oh, don't forget, carefully tighten down the lock ring. Now when you look at targets far away, simply rotating the parallax correction turret, that left turret, to bring the target in focus, and you will come close to correcting the target parallax. In general, mount your scope above the rifle so that the objective lens has only about a quarter to a half an inch clearance above the barrel. The closer the axis of the scope is to the axis of your rifle barrel, the better. If you have a Picatinny rail attached to your receiver, simply place a deck of cards underneath the flat part of the scope. Remove cards enough so that you can tighten down the scope mount screws. When finally satisfied, place a small amount of mild, I emphasize mild, cyanoacrylase thread locker, such as Loctite, on the screws, then tighten them down as per the manufacturer's instructions. A warning, do not, do not use permanent Loctite. 
or you can buy a scope leveling device like I show you here. I cannot emphasize enough the necessity to have a level scope. And I will give you some numbers later as to how destructive to long range accuracy even a small amount of rifle tilt, aka cant, is. If you're having some difficulty leveling your rifle, attach a scope level, but make sure the indicator reflects your horizon line in your scope's reticle. These add-ons tend to slip a bit during recoil. For our final adjustment, we will position the scope on our rifle so that the exit pupil fills our eyes field of view completely. You know, we've already solved half our positioning problem because we have uh, created a consistent cheek weld. But now we're going to move the scope forward or back on the rifle until the eye to ocular lens distance is just perfect. If you step away from your rifle, you can see the white circle called the exit pupil. Move in closer and closer as you position yourself on your rifle, the exit pupil appears larger and the image at the correct distance will completely fill the inner circle of the scope. Get the scope too far forward, a gray ring appears around the sharp radical. Just right, the image fills the entire internal part of the scope. Scope too far back, again the, the, the image does not fill the scope. As you have done with your other scope adjustments, mount the rifle to your shoulder cheek weld in place, eyes closed, then open your eye just a few seconds. This is what you should see. Keep moving the scope front to back on the rifle until you are completely satisfied. Once position is perfect, tighten the locking nuts. Oh, if you, if you don't have a Picatinny rail and are moving the scope fore and aft in its mounts, recheck its level before finishing. You know, at this point I should say a word about this thing called scope bite. Mount the scope too close to your eye and on recoil, your rifle will move vigorously back, probably breaking your shooting glasses and almost certainly giving you an inelegant semicircular scar on your brow. <laughs> Please don't look too closely here. Make as good an adjustment as you can right now, but remember you may have to modify the 4F position just a bit when we, when we get to the range to do our final experiments there. All those adjustments completed, it is now time to progress to the next task, dry firing. Now your real training begins, as it does the fun. We get two benefits from dry firing. First, your own experimenting will find your best trigger press technique to release that striker without causing any movement of the reticle. More importantly, second, dry firing enough times and on enough occasions, you will develop in your mind, in your brain, a powerful and priceless habit pattern that will prevent an erratic trigger press when you begin your range experiments. With this habit ingrained, you will have removed one important variable from your shooting equation. Oh, an aside. You will often hear this technique called muscle memory. Friends, muscles don't have memory. They can only do one single thing. They can't contract. They can't even relax. What you are actually doing is creating a complicated but really strong neural pathway that joins multiple parts of your brain together. Good for us. Brain cells can do that. Our first task in dry fire practice, having assumed your, your good shooting position and good stock well, is to press the trigger in any way that when the hammer or striker falls, there's absolutely no motion of the reticle. I stress, absolute no motion. Let me say a short word here about this idea of follow up or follow through. Follow through is the shooter's ability to immediately reacquire the sight picture, getting ready for the next shot. We'll say a lot more about this in the next video. Take your dry fry practice just shy of getting fatigued. You'll find that what will give out first will be your eyes. Continuing to practice after you have reached this fatigue point will not improve your finger eye brain skills. This, this exercise is not, not the time to be a tough guy or gal. Keep pressing onward and you will be unhappy. Psychologists have shown that our learning actually slides backwards. 
if we continue to, to practice beyond our point of tiredness. When you, have, when you have gotten to the point of being able to drop the, the striker without reticle movement, plus have consistent follow through, then the next habit to develop is to practice manipulating the action so you can get back on target to make a quick follow-up second shot. Most people who do this practice do so for about, say, 15 or 20 trigger squeezes, then take a 5 or 10 minute rest. One final but really important point about mating your rifle to yourself. Notice we've done this work at home without hearing protection. Friends, if you don't effectively protect your hearing at the range, you are going to have a disturbing and distressing old age, one in which your family and friends try to communicate with you, but all you hear are mumbles. First, put your hearing protection muffs on as part of this practice. Make sure that your cheek weld does not move your ear cut. You will almost certainly have to trim the back portion of your sponge rubber. Do whatever it takes. Noise-induced deafness is simply awful. You're now made it to your platform. Congratulations. Before you move to the next video, let me introduce you to a way of thinking about firing a shot precisely. And, and, and I emphasize it is a, a way of thinking, not necessarily the way of thinking. There are four problems to solve to make a long-range hit. First, we're alive. We cannot hold a rifle perfectly still. It's not humanly possible. We are not a steel vice. That imperfection will, do, will introduce a, a, a small dispersion of our hits. Second, it's not humanly possible to drop the hammer or the striker with zero motion. We're human. That will cause another small increase in dispersion side. Third is the normal human reaction to a major explosion. Six inches in front of our faces, the gun fires. Pupils involuntarily dilate, and, and we humans have a startle reaction. The explosion makes us move, even though we, shot after shot, train ourselves to decrease the amount of motion, again, as much as possible, and to try not to blink. Decreasing that amount of motion is what the follow-through phase of the shot is all about. Fourth and finally, there is the invariable Newton's law reaction to the bullet speeding on its way. Downrange, we call that recoil. Learning to manage these four phages is the goal of our training. Of course, we're looking for perfection. We are, we are shooters, but we are human. So, though we will never achieve perfection, it's not a bad goal to strive for, is it? Congratulations, you have completed both missions. You have used careful observations and your own ability to analyze and optimize your platform. Friends, this is the essence of scientific method. Knowledge that empowers you to trust your own findings rather than depend upon an expert, me especially, who may not understand your personal needs. You may think I'm being facetious, but you know, now's the time, you've done a lot. Give yourself a reward, some little reward for work well done. Big or little, doesn't matter. Reward yourself. It's now time to go to the range. On to video three of this long range shooting series. Now the real fun begins.